Last time to begin, and for the last time today, a set of announcements. Um, of course, there's homework six that's available on Canvas, and I hope uh, you're all working through it. Um, it may take some time, so if you've not started, you know, still a day to go, and there's also the late day if you want. Uh, the, the final project uh, needs to be wrapped up by the 3rd of May. 3rd of May, incidentally, is the last day of exams. So, so um, as just a courtesy, I'm giving you a late day also. If you want, you can do May 4th uh, with a 10% penalty. But uh, technically speaking, uh, the semester ends on the 3rd. So try to get it done by the 3rd. Uh, the final project involves submissions to both Canvas and to Kaggle. Um, and I saw that many of you are already kind of uh, have been making submissions and uh, uh, so, you know, uh, keep it up. And those, if you haven't, you know, please get it done. Maybe this homework six will give you ideas for things to submit. And then there's a final exam. Don't forget the final exam. Um, it's everything that we've done from learning theory. It's also on May 3rd. It's the last day of uh, the exam period. Uh, it's not the same time as the class. Uh, keep in mind, it's at 10.30 a.m. Uh, in this room, so uh, uh, please be here, uh, uh, and we'll send an announcement on Canvas just reminding you uh, of all of this anyway. Uh, there was also another sort of a comment that uh, my TA wanted to share. Um, for your homework six, there is a, uh, for the extra credit question, just if you've already submitted it, don't worry about it. If you've done the work, don't worry about it. If you don't feel like doing what I'm going to say next, don't worry about it. But if you feel like exploring something, consider the possibility of your three, the, the depth for the SVM over three, consider the possibility of that, the three depths being less than 10. He says that he played with it and he gets better results when the, the depth limit is made lower. Uh, once again, uh, you don't have to, but uh, if you feel like it and if you have the time and you have the energy, feel free to try it. Any questions about anything? Yes. It's including an after start learning and that's it. But that said, you know, um, uh, there are certain topics that we do cover at the beginning of the semester that we cannot help referring to. Like, uh, for example, the idea of learning or or uh, linear classifiers and such things. So those things are bound to be uh, relevant, but I want to ask you about, say, for instance, uh, uh, online learning or uh, the perceptron algorithm. Yes. So I have a comment on sex. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question. It seems like it's done by the school. So I know, so when next was one, uh -huh. we'll also know the work, but when we get point one and another hypothetical, we just ignore the workload, or should we code so that we can kind of try to attack? Did you have a follow up to that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, you can do something even more interesting, right? If so, let's maybe just briefly talk about this. Uh, so, there is one instance where there's a, when the learning rate is one, things, weird things happen. So, let's not talk about that. But even otherwise, the sigmoid function is one over one plus e power minus z. And when z equals negative infinity, uh, if you naively compute the sigmoid, what you do is one over one plus e power infinity. Well, you know, in, in, in theory, you know the value of this thing. You don't need to compute e power infinity because you know that this becomes infinite and this whole thing goes down to, I made a mistake here. Yeah if z equals negative infinity, then this whole thing goes down to zero. So you could, for instance, if the dot product of the weights and the features is a really large positive number or a really small negative number, you could clamp the value of the sigmoid to minus uh, to zero or one. And you might do a similar thing with the loss also. Um, so, and you have to kind of appropriately adjust the gradient to account for that. Basically, don't compute e power large numbers. And your program, uh, I don't say your program, all our programs are not smart enough to recognize that this whole thing becomes zero, even though it looks like there's an infinite there. 
so what will happen is it will say one over infinity, not a number, and then that will just crash the whole thing. Yeah, this tends to happen with logistic regression. It tends to happen with any sort of a learning uh, system that involves e power things. So sigmoids and tan h have that problem. Did someone else uh, raise their hand? I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. So, oh, I see. So, the individual weights are so large that it's going to be a problem. You could try things like normalizing the weights. Yeah. 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 In fact, there's a version of uh, there's a an extension to I think the standard stochastic gradient descent type algorithm where after every update step there's a normalization, and that way the weight vector never blows up. Uh, this one uh, this was part of a paper called Pegasus. Uh, so if you're interested, this is a two thousand seven or eight paper that at this point you should be able to almost read the paper. The, maybe the math of it might be a little technical, but it's worth checking it out. But you know, just do some normalization if that happens. Did you have a question? Yeah. I try not to test your memory. So, uh, for the most part, if the formula looks really, really complicated, I will not make you remember it. On the other hand, I might do something like I might give you the formula and ask you to prove it. So, I'm more interested in you knowing how to get the things rather than what they are. Because if you know how to do it, then you can reconstruct it. If it is, if in general, uh, I will give you the same courtesy that I would expect. My memory of things is very poor. And so I will not remember really complicated formulas. And I don't want you to either. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a bunch of tricks, and I think we had a discussion about this in office hour. Um, so I'll give you one. For, for instance, you can uh, uh, train a decision tree without uh, when you're computing the entropies, right? For all those things, just think about with how many times you're computing the entropy of the same data set. It turns out that. If you naively implement what we looked at in class, you will compute the entropy of the same data set twice. Once on the outside before making a split and deciding, and once on the inside after you start partitioning that particular uh, you know partition again. So that's sort of uh, th that's one trick that involves refactoring your code to kind of make sure that you don't compute your uh, entropy more than once. Another thing is that uh, most of you are working with Python and you pay the Python tax. Because this is a recursive program, and recursion in Python is, uh, let's just say, it's not good. Um, so then you might want to think about how to kind of work with Python more effectively. Uh, maybe you don't want to make it recursive. Maybe you want to convert it into, uh, you, you know, you have want to use a stack and you want to push this thing. So that sort of thing. A third uh, sort of set of tricks involves. Uh, uh, I had something else there. So we talked about entropy. We talked about the Python tax. Oh yeah. So there's a lot of stuff here that is trivially parallelizable. Um, entropies across all partitions it doesn't. You don't need to uh, compute them in serial line uh, in serial code. So you can use uh, multi-threading code to make this faster. Of course, I mean there's only a, there's a limit to that, uh, but uh, you can make that uh, do that a little faster. So uh, the, the other thing is when you're computing entropies and such things, basically try to cache as much as you can um, so that you don't have to uh, re-compute anything and try to use libraries like NumPy rather than your own implementations of entropy. They tend to be faster. 
But even, even using NumPy naively tends to be not much different. So you have to do some vectorization. Everything I'm describing is not trivial. Of course, there's another thing, write your code in C. Um, uh, but that's so much easier said than done. Um, so it's there are ways of making it faster, but that doesn't mean that they're all easy. They involve a fair amount of work. So you might want to put, think about how to prioritize your time. Another sort of a thing that you could do, because this is an extra credit question, uh, maybe instead of training, what did we ask, a thousand trees? Let's say you do 250, and then you explain that this takes this much time and I can't do this. You'll probably get some credit there, right? So th that's the other uh, sort of pragmatic approach there. But uh, if you feel like doing something over the summer, um, try to make your decision tree code super fast. Uh, should be fun. But it's for some definition of the word fun. Um, did I see someone else raise their hand? There's a question on Zoom. Are we not going to get, so we're not going to get penalized based on accuracy for the extra credit question if the procedure is right. Um, for the extra credit question, I think we are thinking of it rather as uh, giving you points rather than taking away points. So um, if your accuracy is really bad, you will not get the points, but you will get the points, you'll get extra points for what you did. So let's say that I, I don't even, at the top of my head, I can't remember what the accuracies on this data set are. On, you have three data sets. Um, I, I don't remember the details, but uh, let's say that um, you get 65% on some uh, thing. And let's say uh, my TA got 88. We will penalize you. Uh, but instead of thinking of it as a penalty, it's, it's extra credit. I mean, you will get some fractional points. So you, you, rather than thinking of it as being penalized for um, the accuracy, think of it as getting point, extra points for the the getting certain things right. Yeah. Um, first of all, there's so much to do in the game. How should your report work? Can you report some stats in the accuracy one? And then it's like a jump or a key option to go to the other one? Okay. Um, I think, do you want to answer that? Oh, uh, no. Just uh, still the table. So if uh, people didn't get the question and answer on Zoom, what should we report uh, for this homework? The answer is uh, fill up the table that we gave and the, our, the reporting requirements are similar to homework too. All right. Um, that's a lot of logistics. Let's... Uh, Jump back to where we were. Um, there's still a lecture today. Um, we were talking about some practical issues with neural networks. Um, we have already covered what's a neural network. We've talked about training and prediction, and we're talking about practical issues. And the thing where we left things off was uh, um, the when you when we are training all these models, we are taking gradients based on one example, and or a small set of examples, a mini batch, for example. And it's possible that this particular mini batch is not representative of the entire objective. And so it gives you a gradient, even though the real function changes like this, this mini batch gives you a gradient that's dwarf. And so you, it's possible that the, every subsequent step might kind of make the gradient go up and down like this, and you'll kind of slowly get to the bottom of this basin, but uh, it'll be too slow. And there are Standard tricks to go uh, address this, and uh, one of them involves this idea called momentum, which we talked about, um, which is to say that at all points, rather than updating using the gradient, I'm calling the gradient gr, rather than computing the gradient and just taking a step in the opposite direction, you you update your parameters using a weighted average of all the previous gradients. What that means is uh, rather, and how do you compute the weighted average? You don't compute the weighted average by remembering all the previous, previous gradients. You compute a moving average. So if V sub T or V sub T minus one is the previous average, which initialized to zero, you, uh, you can construct VT by interpolating between the previous average and the current gradient. And the interpolation is done using this mu, where you take mu times the previous average plus the standard step size, uh, the learning rate times the current gradient, and then you update. 
Good news, this works, this makes learning more smooth. Bad news, you have another hyperparameter. This time it's the momentum hyperparameter and by default, you know, setting this to some value that's not exactly one, but smaller, close to one tends to be okay, like 0.9 seems to be fine. So this makes the gradient-based learning smoother. Of course, this should not matter for your homework uh, because you have a convex function. This may matter for uh, neural networks that are more complicated because you don't have convex functions. Um, the intuition here is momentum smooths out the uh, updates uh, rather than giving you these sort of uh, wiggly paths in the, uh, in the lost landscape, you kind of get a smoother path to the bottom. Now, this momentum idea uh, is almost like, um, you know, th this was a first stab at this. Then there's more interesting uh, gradient update ideas. One of them is something called Adegrad. Adegrad says, why should you have a single learning rate? I have a neural network with 7 billion parameters. Why should I have a single learning rate? Why not have one learning rate for every parameter that I have? Every weight in the weight vector or weight parameter, parameter matrix gets its own learning rate. And the intuition is the following. Suppose you have this a certain weight that gets updated all the time for certain reasons. Let's not worry about why. And, there is, and a different weight that doesn't get updated too often because the input behaves that way. The thing that gets updated all the time should get faster, smaller and smaller learning rates because it has a lot more output. So you track, rather than counting the number of updates, you count for, uh, here it is, i is the ith parameter. For the ith parameter, what is the update at that time, each time step? So g i t. You take the square of that and you keep accumulating that into this thing called ci. And the learning rate is eta divided by the square root of ci. There's no alpha there. Which says, if ci is large, this particular weight has seen a much larger update, then make its learning rate much smaller. If this particular weight has seen a much smaller update, that is ci is small, much smaller cumulative update over the entire course of the learning, then make its learning rate larger. That way, things that get up, this essentially uh, conceptually, it serves to, uh, you can think of this as reshaping the loss um, in a certain way so that it looks more circular than ellipsoid. Um, if you don't, if that intuition does not give you any uh, help, then don't worry about it. Uh, I'll, there's another uh, thing called uh, RMS prop. I have previously forgotten what RMS prop stands for because that's all I have seen in the last many years. Um, it's very similar to Adegrad. So this, you should compare to this. It's basically the same as CI is CI plus G squared, except this is delta, capital delta, which says more recent uh, gradients get more weightage. Weights that have been updated with larger updates more recently get uh, smaller uh, step size. So it, it's a minor tweak. If delta equals uh, a half, uh, these two are essentially the same because you just get a scaling uh, term. Now, these are just the stepping stones to uh, this thing called Adam. Adam is the one that's used for the most part uh, today for neural networks. I'm not going to teach you Adam because it's a really, really complicated set of updates, but I'm going to tell you all the pieces that it has. It's a combination of many ideas. It uses momentum to smooth the gradient. Momentum says, you know, if the gradients change wildly all the time, take a moving average. It uses something like RMS prop, this thing here, to construct an adaptive learning rate so that different weights have different uh, learning rates and example weights that have larger updates recently have smaller learning rates. Then there are, it turns out by doing this, by itself introduces certain biases because in the beginning of the learning, uh, there's some technical issues which I'm not gonna get into. There are additional terms in the gradient, uh, in the, the learning rate of, uh, rule that are there just to get rid of that bias. Uh, it's a combination of all the best practices and it's baked into all our uh, neural network libraries and it's currently uh, perhaps the most used variant of gradient uh, when we say SGD, people don't say uh, just vanilla SGD, it's like SGD with Adam. 
or people don't even say SJD with Adam. People just say we used Adam to optimize. And that means we use stochastic gradient descent of certain many batches. We used uh, momentum uh, with to smooth the gradient. We used this RMS prop style uh, adaptive gradient, uh, uh, adaptive learning rate study. Then there are all, there are all these extra terms to that come into play at the beginning of learning. All of that gets packaged into this one thing called Adam. All right. Um, since we're talking about neural networks, there's a lot of tricks that we need to keep in mind to prevent overfitting. Um, turns out that neural networks are extremely good at remembering data sets. So if you train a massive neural network on a small data set, rest assured your massive neural network is going to remember every training example in its parameters, uh, which means that it's going to overfit. It means that when it sees examples that look exactly like the training set, it will get perfect accuracy. And when on new examples, it doesn't generalize. One way to get around that might involve things like, uh, um, uh, you know, you choosing all the hyperparameters carefully using cross validation, but cross validation becomes increasingly hard with neural networks because we're talking about training one round of the model. One round of training takes like weeks. Imagine doing five fold cross validation, five weeks for one hyper, one hyperparameter combination, and you have thousands of hyperparameters. Even you'll not get to the end of hyperparameter tuning at which point the whole idea becomes stale. So the standard operating procedure is not to use uh, that. Instead, you keep a fold out validation set. So you take your training set, you take a certain piece of it, keep it aside. You never, you don't update your models on that. It behaves like a test set, but it from, comes out of the training data. And at the end of every epoch, you test your model on that uh, validation set. And as you keep going, you keep the weight of the model that is best so far, and you return that one. Maybe you run it for 100 epochs, but maybe epoch number 63 was the best performing uh, model. That's the one that you return. Um, in practice, what's actually done is you don't just keep those weights. You save the weights after every epoch, because what if your program crashes? So you want to resume from some uh, in the middle. So this is called checkpointing, and these checkpoints are part of the standard libraries. And if you are implementing the the next PyTorch or TensorFlow, just keep that idea in mind. Um, of course, uh, there is also the problem with validation is that that means you lose a bit of your training data. So you have 100 examples. I take 80% for training and 20% as validation. You now only have 80 examples to train on. Cross validation gets around that by uh, doing something, what you're doing in your homework. But then the trade off is you lose time. So, do you want to lose time or do you want to lose data? Depends on what your problem calls for and what uh, your uh, domain and application calls for. One idea that's used for avoiding overfitting with neural networks that we've not really covered, but it's kind of super cool, very easy is something called dropout. It's a very easy idea. Uh, while training, remember, while training, what we do with neural networks is we first do the forward pass, compute the output, then compute the loss. Uh, sorry, compute the, compute the loss, then compute the gradient. Now, what dropout says is at each step, when, you're, when you have a certain mini batch or a single example inside the subgradient, you pretend that your neural network does not have certain nodes. These things are temporarily masked out. And then you use only the paths that go through these things to compute the output. And then you update only the ones that were not masked out, only the, uh, the edges that are attached to the, the weights uh, on the nodes that are not masked out. And then the next batch comes in. You randomly change the mask. You randomly keep changing the mask every time a batch comes in. So what this does is you take a subset of the nodes to make a prediction, and then you uh, uh, kind of pick different subsets at every iteration. This tends to avoid overfitting. There are interesting explanations for why this avoids overfitting. One way to think about it is it makes the network robust uh, and does not allow the mask neurons to remember the exams, examples that showed up at that time. Another intuition is that uh, uh, it's, there is like a certain version of dropout that actually behaves like mathematically like a certain regularizer. 
So dropout tends to behave like a regularizer. It means you don't need to use a regularizer, just use dropout. Another intuition is that it has this effect of averaging across parameters. The path that I've highlighted should produce the right answer on this example. The path that's not highlighted, the, all the nodes that are crossed out, should maybe produce the right answer on a different example. The final model is like an average of all these sub models. And one way or another, dropout is like standard operating procedure now. If you are used training a neural network, you have to use dropout because it gives you better generalization and it leads to better models. So always use dropout and the hyper, it gives you a new hyperparameter. What fraction of nodes gets masked out at each step? And uh, this tends to get, uh, you know, papers will report this in footnote number 17 of appendix number three. So you really have to look hard to find where these hyperparameters are. But it's important because if you don't use the exact values that are in the that have been reported, you might not be able to reproduce uh, a paper. Another thing to think about is another hyperparameter is number of hidden units. If you have many, many hidden units, you will overfit. If you have very few hidden units, you will not be able to accurately represent a concept. Another name for that is you will underfit. So how do you know what's the right size? Use cross-validation or at least performance on a validation set. With neural networks, that tends to be the answer again and again. Anytime I have a design choice about architecture or all these things, answer cross-validation or answer is use validation set. That may seem like a boring answer, but that's better than actually just picking a, a arbitrary value and hoping it works. All right, so that's all I have to say about neural networks. I wanted to get to the end of this by the end of last lecture, but we talked about what neural networks are. Um, this is a, a general strategy for learning any um, uh, continuous function, if you have regression or any decision function for classification. And it's simply con it consists of multiple layers of what are called neurons. Um, each layer can be thought of as constructing a representation of the data that helps better classify the final layer. But the, the final layer classify better. Neural networks are highly expressive. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is uh, something that, uh, that you, it, it used to be the case that whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is unclear. Now we know that with all these other tricks like dropout and the right kind of optimization and scaling up to massive amounts of data, these perform better than most other models. So this is pretty much the standard, uh, the default sort of machine learning device that we tend to use these days. For training back of neural networks, uh, the standard algorithm is backpropagation. If, when I say backpropagation, what that is, is really shorthand for the standard algorithm is stochastic gradient descent, where backpropagation is used to compute the gradient of many batches. And uh, uh, there are other learning rate tricks like uh, this Adam and uh, uh, adaptive gradients and momentum and all that that comes in. So that one word packs a lot. Um, but unfortunately, that's how uh, things are. And uh, the nice thing is that there are fantastic libraries that can implement neural networks today, that implement neural networks today. Um, PyTorch is an um, industrial strength neural network library that's widely used. TensorFlow is another one of those. Google has a project called JAX, which does something really fancy. And uh, it kind of makes you slightly uh, think about Python programs slightly differently, where you think about program taking derivatives of functions, Python functions, where the function creates a computation graph as of the kind that we saw before. Anyway, this is like a very cool and uh, interesting direction that computer science is growing into. And uh, this is just like, I'm, I, all I have given you is like a taste of. Uh, neural networks can be an entirety, entire semester worth of class. In fact, there's gonna be an entire class on uh, deep learning in the fall semester. So if this, excites you, you should check it out. All right. Um, I would normally say, let's, are there any questions here? But uh, since today is the last lecture, and I don't have the choice of stopping a lecture in the middle and saying we'll continue on Thursday, I'm going to continue on. Um, and uh, if there are questions, we can take them after class or uh, somewhere along the way. What I do want to talk about is talk about practical advice for building machine learning applications. Um, 
this lecture is not necessarily a technical lecture, but it's about making machine learning work in the world. Um, this lecture is based on, um, you know, experiential, uh, you know, just me making mistakes and figuring out, and also other people making mistakes and writing about it so that uh, uh, we can learn from others' mistakes. I'll talk about how to diagnose errors in your learning algorithm. And you might say, this is far too late. I've already submitted the homework. Uh, but uh, maybe it's helpful because uh, the homework, all of the, the homeworks in the class are really a sandbox. And I hope that you'll be using these ideas out in the world and this should uh, help. I'll talk about error analysis. How do you know when, when your model goes wrong? And briefly talk about some uh, advice on how do you inject machine learning into something that you care about. And I'll finally wrap up with uh, connecting machine learning to um, the impact that it's having already out in the world. Let's talk about diagnosis. So you've trained a classifier um, in the case of sound detection, and you do all the right things. Uh, you use regularization, you use cross validation for finding the hyperparameter, you make sure that your training and test splits are kind of separated, and you find that you have only uh, a 75 percent accurate model and maybe for spam for your application 75 percent is not good enough so what do you do any ideas any thoughts what could you do you've done all the right stuff your code has no bugs yes you can take a look at your features yes get more data any other ideas Something around features, yes. Basically, there are not too many answers here. Answer number one, get more data. Answer number two, change your features. Answer three, improve your training. So more training data is always better, but you know, all, all of these are good. But if, when I say improve features, you could get more features, you could get less features, you could change your features. With better training, you could train your model more by running for more epochs. You could use a different learning algorithm. You could use a different hypothesis space or a different classifier. You could play around with regularization and dropout and all those ideas. Unfortunately, there are too many options here. This is super tedious. And in fact, there's going to be a dependency between the things that you do. And if you change the features and then change the learning algorithm, maybe it's different from changing the algorithm and then changing the learning. So you need to be a little bit more methodical about diagnosing problems with your learning algorithm with your learning system. So let's first diagnose some problem. It's possible that your classifier might be overfitting. And this is something that uh, it's called high variance. High variance means your class, your, the learner that you've got is, and the hypothesis space uh, that you're uh, exploring uh, ends up overfitting the training, the specific training data that you have and changing the data set will change your model a lot. So that's why it underperforms on the test set. So overfitting leads to underperformance on the test set. You could have underfitting. Underfitting, or equivalently, something called high bias. Uh, underfitting means your hypothesis space is not expressive enough to characterize the concept. Maybe you have your true concept is an XOR function and you're switching your hypothesis space is a linear classifier. Maybe your learning algorithm has not converged, and it's also possible that you're not measuring the right thing. So let's go through this one at a time. Overfitting is a situation where the training accuracy is much more than the test accuracy or the validation accuracy. In other, way, in other words, the, your model explains the training set a lot better than it does generalize. Uh, and the word variance shows up in this context also. Uh, there's something called the bias and the variance trade-off. Variance describes how much the best classifier depends on the specific training set you have. If tomorrow someone just randomly took out your training data and give you a different set consisting of the same number of examples and your classifier changes quite a bit, that means your classifier really is remembering your training data. So that's variance. Um, underfitting is a situation where both training and test accuracies are unacceptably low. In other words, the hypothesis space you have chosen cannot even represent the concept well. Sometimes this is called high bias. High bias is the, uh, is the case where the true error of the classifier 
uh, sorry, the true error of the best classifiers is still not good enough. So, um, or the true loss. Um, underfitting happens when bias is high. Uh, when even the best classifier in your hypothesis space is, has an unacceptably high error. Uh, there's something called the bias variance trade off. There's a conceptually uh, something you can think of the error of a classifier as coming because of the bias plus the variance and because of noise. And this can be made formal for regression and it has been studied extensively for regression, but there's a uh, intuitive generalization to classification as well. A high bias, as I said, uh, happens when the classifier cannot represent the training data. And high variance happens when your classifier, when your learner overfits the training data set. Ma for ma you know, there are many strategies for ma managing bias and variance, and it tends to be a trade off. So, for instance, if you have an ensemble method, if you have an ensemble of many classifiers, the average uh, or the ensemble tends to reduce variance. So, when you combine multiple classifiers uh, with decision trees, increasing the depth decreases bias. What that means is with uh, uh, decreasing the uh, or increasing the depth increases the decreases the bias. When the depth of the tree increases, it ends up even the best the best classifier ends up having um, low error on the training data. Uh, but then it increases the variance. With SVMs, uh, changing your features to use polynomials, which is another way of saying polynomial kernels, uh, tends to decrease bias because it can express more complicated things. But it increases variance because it can end up memorizing the training data. Regularization increases bias, but decreases variance. With neural networks, larger models increases variance because it can memorize data sets, but decrease bias because it can actually represent more complicated things. Uh, we didn't talk about k-nearest neighbor, but uh, um, the simple idea of a k-nearest neighbor classifier is you take a feature point, a new example comes in, you don't do any training. A new example comes in. For that example, you look at the k-nearest point in the training data. And the output label is the average of those labels or the majority of those labels. So if K increases and you're computing uh, the entire data set, then your uh, uh, the bias tends to increase because, well, we haven't covered it, so I'm not going to talk about it. To detect high variance, what happens, you can plot these sorts of uh, things called learning curves, where you increase the size of the training data and you calculate the error. As the, as the training data increases, the error of your model tends to increase a bit before flattening out. It increases a bit because in the beginning, there is very little training data and any reasonable model will be able to memorize it. So it will have no training error, but eventually it will kind of flatten out. On the same plot, you also plot the test error or the generalization error. And if you find that there's always this big gap between these two, uh, then the, the that means that this is a sign that you may have high variance. The gap, the, the training, the test error never really gets to close enough to the training data. For detecting bias, you make the same plot, but you find that the, these two things converge. Maybe they converge, but uh, even when they converge, the error that they converge to is still very high. Even the best classifier has an unacceptable error, which means your model, your hypothesis space can't represent any. Uh, uh, this concept at all, so you might have to think about a better hypothesis space. So these plots are worth kind of putting into your standard sort of toolkit. This is a difficult plot to uh, uh, construct because the horizontal axis is the size of the training set. So you keep training every point here it corresponds to one model trained on a data of this size. So you have to train a lot of models to get there. So um, we talked about um, uh, you know, underfitting and overfitting. It turns out that adding more training data helps overfitting. Well, because if you're adding more data, then your model is going to have a harder time overfitting all that data. So in the limit, if you add infinite data, it's okay to overfit infinite data. Why? Because that's all the data there is. So there's no notion of generalization beyond that. So as data sets get larger, uh, it helps to uh, uh, avoid overfitting. 
adding more features can help underfitting because it improves the representation capability of your system. Uh, expressiveness is increases. Removing features can help overfitting. Adding other features, well, we don't know what you're doing, so it could do both. Playing with regularization can help with overfitting or underfitting. Maybe if you increase the regularization to be too strong, it can help combat overfitting. But if you make regularization extremely strong, that uh, it can uh, give up on overfitting, but cause underfitting because your model does not express things. So we talked about overfitting and underfitting. There's another problem. It's possible that your learning is not done. Imagine that you're, you you framed your learning problem as an optimization problem, which is what uh, we kind of do for the most part. And what you should do as a force of habit is to track something called uh, this, uh, the, track the loss function over the, uh, 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 over the iteration. The horizontal axis could be number of updates or it could be number of epochs. Usually these days people plot the number of updates on the horizontal axis. And just eyeballing this, you could argue that the model, this is the, uh, the goal is to minimize the objective. Eyeballing this, you know that in this place, the objective is not converged. Whereas here, well, it's still going down, but it's practically done. The improvement, the, 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 negli the subsequent iteration gives only negligible improvement. So you can just stop learning that. However, this is not an easy decision always because what if your curve is still going down? Is it done or it's not? Not clear. What you do, what, however, this sort of a curve can help you debug your code because you are running a gradient based optimizer. One guarantee that you get is even if your objective is not convex, you will get to a local minimum. So this objective value has to generally go down. So if you see a curve like this, something's wrong. Because every time you remember you're going down the hill, and the analogy here is if your if your program is guaranteed to keep going down that hill, and then you measure the objective, which is the analogy in this analogy is the elevation, and the objective goes up and down a lot. That means there's something wrong with either your gradients or your learning rate, or somewhere there's a bug. So the, the, plotting the uh, the objective value as learning proceeds is very very good. Uh, it helps debug, in particular with convex functions. This is super helpful. But even with things that are not convex, like neural networks, this is uh, this gives a good uh, diagnostic. Uh, it serves as a good diagnostic. Uh, for stochastic gradient descent, if the curves won't be this smooth. I mean, this is wrong, but the curves won't be like this. You'll see something that may kind of be a bit wiggly, but the trend will be that it's going down. And now there are. Uh, tools that allow you to track these things. There are Python libraries that allow you to track these things uh, pretty efficiently uh, by sending data to a server, and then you can plot these uh, curves on, uh, uh, on uh, there's some website, I forget its name. If you ping me afterwards, I can send you the name that kind of keeps track of your experiment run. And you know there are a few of those actually. All right. so. Uh, we talked about this. Whether you should use a different learning algorithm or not might depend on whether your objective is converging. Maybe your choice of learning algorithm is to, but when I say learning algorithm, I also mean learning hyperparameters like learning rate and such things. Maybe those choices are not great if you if it turns out the objective is not converging fast enough. One important thing that uh, is worth always keeping in mind is whenever you encounter a new problem where you want to use machine learning, ask yourself, how do you measure success? How do you know whether your classifier is doing the right thing? And a trivial way of answering that question is, well, I'm going to measure accuracy. If my predicted label is the same as the true label, my model is doing the right thing. But it turns out accuracy, while it's the most common measurement, is not always the right thing. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a task where, and a data set where for every thousand positive examples, you have one negative example. Imagine that there's a classifier that predicts, that looks at the data, does not even look at the example, predicts the label is positive. It does not care what the input is. It always predicts that the label is positive. 
its accuracy is going to be 99.9%, which looks impressive until you note that, uh, well, predicting 99.9% .9 is useless if all I care about is the negative rate. Right? Um, so, to, which means that in this sort of a situation, accuracy is actually misleading. For unbalanced data set, there are other uh, metrics that are helpful. In particular, the thing that you should use is something called precision recall and f-score. Precision for a label could be a precision for the positive label or precision for the negative label is the following. Among the examples that my system predicted as plus, for example, what fraction of them were actually plus? Recall is among the pluses that existed in the data, how many did my classifier actually find? Or the minus? In a classifier that predicts all positive would have zero recall for the negative label because among the one recall that one uh, negative example that's there, it predicted zero. F score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall, which is just a fancy way of saying F is two times precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. If this is hard to remember, then remember that two divided by F is. So it's the harmonic mean. This is the definition of a harmonic mean. So if your data is unbalanced, always do me uh, measure position and recall. Let's talk more about error in R. In this class, we've been talking a lot about machine learning. Not surprising. This is a machine learning class. So your code might involve a lot of machine learning stuff like gradients and uh, updates and uh, learning algorithms and cross validation and all that stuff. So it may seem like the whole world here is machine learning. Well, in practice, it turns out that that little, that big box is actually this little thing here. And there are all these other engineering pieces that need to be in place um, for actually taking machine learning out of just this sort of a Python notebook or something that you have and deploying your system. You have to collect the data. You have to think about features. You have to think about verifying that your data is good. You have to have tools for analysis. You have, to have tools for debugging. Um, there's this whole thing about making sure that your machine learning models don't crash. Uh, there's the serving infrastructure. You need to keep monitoring all the stuff that comes into play from software engineering shows up. And actually more because we're talking about programs that are inherently statistical. They are not guaranteed to be right all the time. So unit tests are a bit tricky to write for this kind of code. Uh, this is a picture from a Google paper from 2015. 2015 is eight years old now. Uh, at this point, this feature is going to be vastly uh, too naive. And right now, it's, uh, there are multiple machines and multiple GPUs. There are entire data centers, and all the code has to be orchestrated across data center centers. So the point is, in the context of all of these things, the specific machine learning code that you're looking at, you know, back propagation and uh, gradients and all that might be actually a tiny piece. It's at the core of it. The whole thing is irrelevant if the core disappears, but it's still comparatively smaller. So there's a whole, there were a few papers uh, from the industry, from Google actually, uh, that talked about how when we start thinking about machine, deploying machine learning, we need to be careful about how we build our infrastructure. By just packing together code, and you know, getting a model that works does not mean that it's actually good enough to maintain. Always remember that any code that you write is going to be maintained by some guy or some girl who is 10 years down the line, who is never going to get to talk to you and will hate your existence because you did not document it. I always write my code for that person. Um, because you know the, that's the person who's going to run my code. Um, so, you know, make sure that the infrastructure is right. Let's talk about error analysis a bit. Uh, like I said, machine learning plays a small but important role in a larger application. And there are other pieces that have to come into play. We need to gather data. And anytime we gather data, there might be assumptions. Imagine that you are uh, gathering data about, say, um, uh, say some medical condition that affects populations in sub-Saharan Africa. You want to collect data for that particular medical condition and you go out to Salt Lake City and gather data about that. Maybe not the greatest idea. So 
Think about the assumptions that come into play. You can have the largest data set in the world, but it could be useless. Um, Pre-processing, maybe your pre-processing is the function that takes your example and returns the number zero. Uh, you can completely destroy the signal if you do the wrong kind of pre-processing. You should think about what features your system is using and maybe the features themselves are coming from other machine learning systems. You can think about data transformation. Maybe the raw data that you're working with needs to be transformed in interesting ways. For example, images might, if for say uh, some sort of object recognition, Maybe you need to transform your data to certain scales so that it fits on your GPU. And maybe by transforming your data to that scale, you lose the signal because your uh, compression algorithm introduces enough artifacts that everything is lost. Then problem, then no machine learning is going to help you there. And important, increasingly, the user interface to machine learning is also getting important because these tools are getting deployed not just to people who have a background in computer science, but people who are anyone. So uh, we have to think about how do you present uncertainties to a user? How do you present the case that the model predicted a label with probability uh, 0.500001? So its label is plus, but the model really doesn't want it to say plus. But if you just say plus, the user will think, oh, this is a, this, um, uh, the program told me that the label is plus, so it should be plus. How do you represent uncertainty? And each of these can contribute to the error. So it's worth thinking about. Uh, when I say error, I mean in the larger scheme of things, how, when the model is actually used. Error analysis is the process of uh, explaining why a system is not performing properly. And error analysis is an art because there is no, it, it's hard to teach it. It's one of those things where you just have to do it by, learn it by doing it. And it depends on the domain. One sort of error analysis style that's useful is an ablative study, where you compare the uh, two models, one model that is the full system that you've built and a weaker system. The weaker system could have fewer features, it could have a simpler neural network architecture, it could have a different neural network architecture, um, or some, some sort of a uh, curtailed version of the full system. And this will tell you what that extra thing that you added in the full system has contributed to that or to the system performance. Um, in general, the rule here is it's not enough to say that your classifier works. If you cannot explain why it works, or if you cannot interpret its behavior, then all you have is a black box that may catastrophically fail at some point, and you just are waiting. You can't tell when. It's worth keeping that in mind. Let me give you an example. Uh, is the contrast here good enough? Can you count the number of people in this picture? This, by the way, was a quote unquote machine learning protest that showed up outside uh, CMU um, about a decade or so back, where they talk about Bayesians against discrimination and support vector machines. Uh, how many people are in this picture? Sorry? Five. Uh, how do you get five? Okay, I think there are five people, but. You know, imagine that you train a classifier that uh, detects heads and legs and uses them to count the people. There are three heads, three hands, and four legs. At best, there are about two and a half people here. <laughs> and yet, we all agree that there are five people. It's not enough to just ask your system, classifier, make a prediction. There is some sort of reasoning that's happening outside of just the machine learning. Right? This is crazy. I mean, they, they, I have shown this picture many, many times, and people always say there are five people. I think there are five people too. But if you ask for how, they bring in facts that the machine learning system never knows about, that every person can have at most one head. The classifier that was trained to detect heads was not told that. The data set, of course, did not have two headed people, but the classifier did not even think to actually attach importance to that feature. So learned systems are not used in isolation, but they, are, they can be used in conjunction with each other and in the context of a larger application. And just naively believing them can kind of compound the error. Let's talk about how you might inject machine learning into your favorite task. You might 
you know, we talked about tasks, you know, classification tasks in the abstract, where I said, assume that we have d dimensional features, or assume that we have documents or uh, images or something. But maybe you don't care about documents and images. Maybe you want to uh, classify um, x rays or uh, x ray uh, uh, chest radiographs. So maybe you want to classify uh, readings from a Geiger counter. I don't know. Or things that I can't even come up with on the spot. I would like to talk about some general principles that are worth keeping in mind when you are introducing machine learning ideas into whatever task you want to um, uh, apply it to. Always ask yourself, do you have the right evaluation method? In fact, lately I've gotten into the habit of asking about the evaluation even before any model is designed, because that's the first thing to think about. How do you define success? If you are if you cannot define success objectively, then you're not going to measure it objectively and you're just going to say, oh yeah, it looks good or not good, doesn't matter. And also worth thinking about, does your loss function actually please loosely correspond to your definition of success? No matter what your application is, you should always be wary of data contamination. The simplest kind of data contamination is your training set is contaminated by your test set. The easiest way to get 100% accuracy on a data set is to add a feature called the label. Then you're and train a linear classifier, your linear classifier will attach full weight to that feature and get the perfect accuracy. Another way to get a very, very high accuracy is to just put the test set into the training set and uh, you know measure on the test set. Of course, overfitting on the training data will let you get perfect accuracy. It's completely useless. The first lesson in this semester was learning is not about fitting a data set, but it's about generalizing to new examples. Test sets represent new examples. They represent the unseen, the unknown, the future, something that you cannot measure or cannot even access during training. In a perfect world, you should not even look at your test set because you might accidentally contaminate your features or your model design through your brain by accidentally looking at the example and saying, you know, I don't know why, but maybe this particular feature is going to help. But you know why, you looked at the test set. So don't even, I mean, the advice I give my students is, if possible, put the test set in a zip file and you know, don't even write code that reads it. And train your models, you know, do whatever you can, get your one best model. When you have one best that model that you're willing to deploy, you're using the test set as a way of confirming that your model works. Using and at that point, you can unzip that file. And in general, I'm always suspicious of perfect classifiers. If I have a if, if somebody gives me a classifier that is perfect, I tend to think one of two things. They have contaminated the training data, or the task is so simple it does not need machine learning. So just be if if somebody gives you a perfect classifier, always dig deeper. Maybe it's one of those rare instances where the task requires machine learning, the data is not contaminated, and the particular hypothesis class that you chose is the right thing that exposes the mind of nature. How lucky could you be? Uh, you know, be aware of the bias variance trade-off or equivalently overfitting versus underfitting. And we talked about D dimensions. You know, they talked about d-dimensional spaces, pretending that we all agree what d-dimensions are. And anytime someone asks me, well, how do you know what d-dimensions is? I say, imagine a, uh, uh, just an array of d-numbers. We have an intuition for three dimensions because we'll operate, we live and operate in the three-dimensional space. We have an intuition for two dimensions because, you know, all the surfaces that we have are two dimensions. We barely, if at all, have an intuition for four dimensions. I don't think I do. But, um, our models today uh, are, are working in millions of dimensions. What does it mean to work in a million dimensional space? How can I talk about hyperplanes and into, you know, intuitions in million dimensional spaces? Unless you can prove things rigorously with algebra, intuitions can be misleading because of something called the curse of dimensionality. Higher dimensions don't behave like three dimensional spaces. The, the curse of dimensionality is a very, very fun topic that I'll let you uh, read about on your own. It's one of those things that is really mind-bending. We talked about a lot of theory, but 
Sometimes the theoretical guarantee might only be theoretical because it makes invalid assumptions. Um, like the data is separable. If the data is separable, the perceptron algorithm algorithm will work. Well, how do I know the data is separable? Answer from the perceptron algorithm. Not really a satisfying answer. Maybe there are certain uh, theoretical guarantees that only work with infinite data. Like when you're talking about estimating probability. Maybe the experiments on real data will actually undo the guarantees that the theory has. So you should always think about if even if you the theory excites you a lot, always think about uh, experimental uh, evidence. More and more data is not always a good thing. But more data, uh, sorry, more and more data is not always the answer, but more data could always be a better thing. But even better is actually clean data that is relevant to the task that you care about. Uh, learning is search over function. And without any simplifying assumptions for that search, learning is impossible because uh, there's no chance for generalization otherwise, which means that learning requires knowledge. Machine learning is not just a magic wand that you can just wave at any data set and you get, um, you know, things just work. It requires knowledge, but knowledge that is not always well stated. Like think about, uh, you know, the, the, hy the hypothesis space and think about the learning algorithm. Which model is the right task? You know, linear models or decision trees or deep neural networks or neural networks of certain architecture. Which learning algorithm should you use? Maybe certain learning algorithms have critical assumptions that your data violates, like separability, for instance. And maybe sometimes it doesn't matter. Feature engineering is another place where you can inject knowledge. You design features for your task because you understand your domain. And one way or another, all of these are really claims about the nature of the problem and the domain. It's because you, you cannot think of uh, you know, being a machine learning engineer who can just be airdropped into a new domain and you will wave your magic wand and everything will work. Because you need to understand the task. You need to understand the domain. And that's where we, it's important to have a conversation with domain experts. And I'll talk about why it becomes more important uh, uh, now than ever in a bit. Other random advice that I couldn't fit into any uh, unified slide, um, the, you know, any uh, title. Uh, as a general rule, learn simpler models first, because if it works, you're done. If not, at least you have a good baseline. Um, for some reason, as a general rule, ensembles seem to work better. So if you have a if you have more time, train an ensemble because that's really uh, going to help. Yeah. There are papers that actually use ensembles for neural networks, and they give slight improvements. Uh, the standard ensemble for neural networks, the standard approach for ensembling neural networks, or the most common one, is something called product of experts. Uh, it's a very simple idea. I may have mentioned this uh, in a previous lecture, but it's a very simple idea that you should check out offline. Finally, or maybe at the very beginning, when you are the airdrop into a domain and you are asked to apply machine learning, ask yourself whether a problem is actually learnable at all. Because learning is about generalization. I'll give you an example of a problem that is not learnable. Imagine that uh, you ask me to build a classifier that can predict the output of a random number generator. And you are willing to give me an, like as many examples as I need. Even if you give me an infinite number of examples, I cannot predict the next uh, roll of a die because it's truly random. Randomness is the enemy of learnability. You cannot learn uh, things that are truly random. So, you know, think about whether a problem is learnable at all. Finally, I want to spend the last 15 minutes talking about making machine learning matter out there in the real world. In uh, 2012, uh, at this conference on machine learning, ICML is a conference, it's called short for International Conference on Machine Learning. Kitty Waxter, who was uh, an alum of uh, Utah, uh, she did her undergrad here in uh, the late 90s and then went on to work, did do a PhD at I think Cornell and then worked for NASA JPL. She gave a talk uh, to ICML where she passed, she kind of uh, listed six challenges to the greater machine learning community. Essentially the idea was, so you think your field is so cool. 
I mean, her field. He was, she is a machine learning person. The challenge here is, can you make machine learning do all these things? Is there any law or any legal decision that is passed that purely relies on a machine learning uh, analysis? Can $100 million be saved through improved decision making through machine learning? Can some sort of international conflict be prevented because of a machine, because of translation provided by machine learning? Can we reduce cybersecurity break ins by 50%? Uh, maybe a machine learning system, can it actually look at a, you know, help diagnose a condition and save one human life, just one? Um, can we improve a country's human development index using machine learning by 10%? These are big challenges. And some of these challenges, it turns out in the 10 years since then, some headway has been made. But still, these are, you know, there is no conclusive answer here. Data driven, driven decision making is increasingly prevalent. It's not just about proof of concept that uh, machine learning uh, is used for, it's out there in the world. It's worth thinking about, you know, do your classifiers that you train exhibit some sort of biases? What about your data sets? How do you ensure that decision making systems that are built on top of learned systems are transparent? How do you uh, you know, uh, how do you know when you can leave your decision making to a learned system? Can you believe it? Can you believe it in all these difficult situations that I described earlier? What if uh, your statistical systems that you train operate in ethically dubious ways? And I'll give you examples of uh, that in uh, in a bit. Notice that none of these are talking about accuracy, precision, recall, loss, any of the things that we talked about in the class. These are all auxiliary criteria that come from when a system gets deployed. And it's not directly tied to the objectives that we are minimizing while learning, but it becomes important because machine learning is no longer proof of concept. Um, for example, what if a learning system were to decide how long someone should be sentenced to a crime or whether someone's loan application should be uh, approved or whether someone should be fired? All three of these are real-life examples. Imagine that you get a job and uh, you go to work on the day one and then the HR informs you, sorry, we decided to fire you because you fell on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Not a very satisfying explanation. How do you ensure that, by the way, some of these things are actually illegal. How do you ensure that your classifier that you train you know, or any machine learning system that you build does not act in illegal or at least even unethical behavior. How do you know what is fairness of a classifier? Can you guarantee? I'm, by the way, I'm asking a lot of questions here, not giving any answers because these are all open questions. These are questions that we as a community should think about. You are part of the machine learning community now. Uh, we should think about because we are the ones who are going to be deploying these things. Can we guarantee that uh, the system does not do any harm? There are easy kinds of harm that we can define, like your self-driving car should not run over people. But there are also more complicated kinds of harms, like what if your uh, learning system only rejects loan applications for certain types of people? It may not seem obvious until you start collecting that kind of statistical evidence. How do we design algorithms and evaluation schemes that avoid these types of discrimination? And Maybe this discrimination comes not because of your machine learning system, but because of your data collection. How do you ensure that your data collection is fair? There's another increasingly obvious thing that in hindsight seems like a no brainer. We deserve a right to explanations. If your classifier decides to fire you, a good explanation is not you fell on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Even worse, what if the classifier is 99.9% .9 accurate and you are the 0.1%, you are in that 0.1%. Doesn't seem fair, so how do we develop methods that can not just make predictions, but can also transparently explain their decision-making process? Talking about high dimensional spaces is not very helpful when you want to talk to say a lawmaker. How do we, uh, in general, the question of building algorithms that can not only make decisions, but also explain their decision is open. In fact, machine learning has invaded our lives so much that we need to start thinking about 
legal systems are the current legal systems robust? Maybe certain laws need to be rewritten. Some of you may have an interest in you know, the legal aspects of things, you know, or technology policy. Increasingly, we need to be doing that. People who are in technology need to start thinking about policy because technology is actually affecting our lives. What if, for instance, evidence in a lawsuit is faked because uh, uh, by providing a picture that was generated, that was from a generative model. This is not a work of fiction because uh, we are seeing uh, a very, very good images created by these models uh, these days. Who's to, who's to blame if a machine learning system makes a mistake? Is it the person who wrote the code? Is it the learning algorithm? Is it the person who trained the model? Is it the person who collected the data? Is it the organization that runs the system? It's completely unclear. We have no clue, but without actually having a clue, we are happy to, as a community, we are happy to digest and deploy these models uh, out in the world. What if an ML-based system decides uh, to control a weapon? And you may say that's like Terminator, this is not going to happen. But in fact, militaries around the world are actually using machine learning to uh, quote unquote help guide weapons. Once again, you don't want to be in that 0.0001% that error that that system makes. So how do you uh, address that? All of this, these questions tend to fall into this collection of topics called fairness, accountability, and transparency. There is a great set of co conferences that have been happening since 2018, past conferences that uh, you should check out. Uh, the point here is that we need to ensure our algorithms are fair, our algorithms are held accountable, or the people who run the algorithms are held accountable, and our algorithms exhibit transparency in their decision-making processes. Easier said than done. In fact, these are the technical challenges that I give to you because you are the next generation. If you want to answer difficult questions, answer these. Uh, it's worth keeping all of these questions in mind when at every step of the pipeline, when you're collecting the data, when, even when you're defining the task, when you're uh, defining your evaluation, when you train your models, when you decide on, on your features, at every step along the way, these questions actually tend to matter. This is a very large set of topics. The question of ethical use of machine learning is something that is getting more and more important to the point where uh, different countries are actually coming up with their own policies and possibly even laws around these topics. If this sort of thing matters to you, you should, you know, now that you actually understand the internals, because it, it, you should kind of talk about it. The reason is, if you don't talk about it, who will? Because people who understand this stuff should actually talk about it. Let's go back and look at the course again. Um, not going to do the whole course because uh, you only have six minutes, but uh, I want to talk about just a retrospective look. In the very first lecture, I flashed this slide. And I said, this is from Tom Mitchell's textbook. A computer program is said to learn from experience, E, with respect to some class of tasks, T, as defined by some performance metric P, if um, as the program gets uh, accumulates more experience, its performance in those tasks increases. When I first presented this slide, this probably just was like too much. I hope this makes more sense now. Um, when we talk about metrics, we talk about things like accuracy, precision, recall. When we talk about tasks, we talk about a decision or a classification or a regression task. And when we talk about experience, we're talking about accumulating data. As the program sees more data, it gets better. We saw different types of models. And when I say model, I put it in quotes here uh, because that word gets used for many things. Uh, what I mean by model here is what kind of a function does your learning system uh, explore? We looked at decision uh, trees, we looked at linear classifiers for a large part, we looked at nonlinear classifiers via feature transformations and neural networks. Also, we looked at ensembles of these uh, systems. We looked at, there are different learning protocols. There is the supervised protocol where a teacher supplies a collection of examples and uh, the learner has to learn to label uh, new examples using that data. This is the supervised setting that we spent the entire semester on. We did not spend any time on unsupervised learning. There is no teacher, the learner just gets unlabeled examples and has to figure out uh, regularities in the data. 
This tends to show up in data mining. This tends to show up in clustering. And if you're interested, there are classes that cover those. We did not talk about semi-supervised learning because that tends to build on unsupervised and supervised together, where there are some labeled examples and a whole bunch of unlabeled examples. Can the learner somehow use the labeled data to discover the right kind of regularity in the unlabeled data and get actually better? We looked at many different learning algorithms, but very at a broad uh, categorization would be we looked at online algorithms where the learner uh, accesses one labeled example at a time. Uh, and the only algorithm that we saw in this category really was the perceptron algorithm. Uh, and then we spent a quite, a, quite a bit of time looking at batch algorithms where the learner can actually access the entire data in its memory, then do whatever iterations it wants and partition the data and do anything. Most of the algorithms we looked at uh, involve uh, batch algorithms like SVM, logistic regression, the batch perceptron, Decision tree, random forest. We did not look at the tables, but that's a batch algorithm. It's a borderline batch algorithm. Uh, we looked at boosting or uh, any sort of an ensemble. Most of the ensembles we looked at, uh, neural networks, all of these are batch. A question that we touched upon a lot, but did not actually answer because it's more than a machine learning question is how do you represent data for a particular task? The important point here is if your features are right, then learning is solved because all you have to do is train a linear classifier. But then the question is, how do you get the right feature? You think hard about a problem or make it into a learning problem. Either way, you actually have to do extra work. Maybe you have too many features and you want to reduce the dimensionality and that is something that we did not cover, but uh, there are standard techniques from linear algebra on reducing dimensionality, which involve things like uh, matrix factorization or some things like that, PCA, for example. We spent a bit of time looking at the theory of machine learning, where we mathematically defined the notion of learning. In fact, one way of thinking about this entire semester is we try again and again to define what is learning. Each definition give us, gives us different learning algorithms. When I say learning is uh, uh, the case where the learner stops making mistakes in a stream of examples, we get this online setting. And uh, in, or mistake driven setting, and that gives us the perceptron algorithm. When we say that uh, learning involves this probably, accept, uh, probably approximately correct definition of learning, like uh, in other words, with high probability, we want the system to give us a hypothesis that is almost right. We, using that, we get algorithms like SVM, and extending that gives us uh, loss minimization. When we say learning is Finding the best classifier, the most probable model given the data, it gives us Bayesian learning that gives us things like logistic regression. And uh, we didn't talk about uh, naive Bayes, but it gives us that also. These are all very closely connected to each other because uh, we, we made, kept making jumps from one to the other through the semester. It turns out, I would argue that machine learning is actually too easy. I know that's why you came to the class, right? You thought it's an easy A. It's almost too easy. And for the following reason, it's a remarkably diverse collection of ideas. And yet they are all very similar. And yet they are, in practice, they all work very, very similarly. Uh, SPM, logistic regression, and average perceptron tend to behave very, very similarly if they are all tuned well. When I say tuned, I mean the right hyperparameter. So there's like this remarkable convergence of ideas. We did not cover a lot of things in the class because it's a growing field. In fact, the things we did not cover is probably another two semesters of class. Um, but what we did see is the foundations of how to think about machine learning. And uh, you know, hopefully what we covered in the class would help you pick up on these other topics quickly. There are, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, there are other classes that you can um, uh, take at the U, uh, like data mining, various AI classes, applications like NLP, computer vision, robotics, there's a, sometimes there's a class on the theory of machine learning that gets taught visualization. You can think of specializations of deep learning for various things, or uh, sometimes I teach a class called structured prediction. There are many other uh, follow-up classes that you can take. This course was about understanding the fundamental concepts and the algorithmic ideas in the field of machine learning. It's not about any specific learning tool and not about any specific learning paradigm, but instead, hopefully, it gave you a sampler 
for a whole bunch of ideas that now you can kind of, if one thing interests you the most, you can follow up. What we did see was a broad and theoretical and practical understanding of machine learning, uh, its various paradigms, and a whole collection of algorithms. What you got by uh, means of the homework and the project was the ability to implement algorithms to the point where if you were careful and if you think back about it, you have essentially the beginnings of a brand new machine learning library, uh, maybe buggy, but still something that, that looks good. And hopefully through application, you were able to identify uh, what kinds of uh, problems can machine learning be applied and what are the right decisions to make about things like models and uh, algorithms and supervision and such things. We are at 1.45, so that is literally the end of the semester. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be your guide. Uh, it's been fun. Every time I teach this class, I feel like I learn something new. And hopefully it's been good for you too.